<laughs> Is this thing on? Yes, it's on. Yes, Jeff. How is everybody out there? Yeah. Uh huh. It's one button. It shouldn't be that hard at all. First off, welcome back. Thank you very much for coming to the Fan Expo Dallas, and thanks for spending time with us this week. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Um, I'm, I, I want to get this out of the way because the majority of the people in here who have never done a voiceover session or um, worked in, in video wants to know, and we'll just get it out of the way quick, how do I get your job? So let's just start there and move forward because hey, um, I, I've, I've done some video projects before you. Your CV is ridiculously long. Have you, have you looked at what you've done lately? <laughs> <laughs> if I look at what I've done, I'm looking that way, and life is that way, and this way. You know? Talk a little about your first session, because everybody gets into video generally by, just, uh, you go in as a gaggle of people, um, as a, it's called a wall session. It happens in many different ways. There's no single way to get in. I mean, for myself, I worked at a, I was a PA production assistant at a video studio next door to an audio studio, and they need somebody, who's in Birmingham, Alabama, they needed someone who could talk without a southern accent and do like a younger voice, or I think it was actually a valley girl, and I could do a valley girl. So I went and did the valley girl, and they paid me $35, and I was like, wait, what? <laughs> That's insane. So I started really working um, and just asked the guys there how to do it and what I could do, and I just kept going over and learning and asking and learning and asking and learning, and then I made, there were no agents in town, so I made a demo tape and um, uh, cold called ad agencies on a schedule to get through their business, which was mortifying and terrifying, and, you know, I was still in my teens, and I put on a little suit and walked around and, you know, door to door, and, uh, then I kept remaking my demo every few months because the learning curve in the beginning is like this. That's the one piece of advice I would give you if you make a reel. Um, don't spend a lot of money on your first couple of reels because your learning curve is like this and you're going to be so much better in a matter of months. You're going to be like, oh my gosh, I cannot put that out there. It's just not. <laughs> um, yeah. Is there one thing that you did early on where it actually clicked in. I can do this for a living. Was it the Valley Girl piece, or was it something else where you're you're in the booth, you've got the cans on, in like hour three or whatever? And you say, I can actually do this for a living and not have to worry about waiting tables. Well, I started not in animation or games. I started doing car commercials, small market car commercials, and I realized there was a market for it, and they needed women who could do it well. And I was like, I can learn how to do that, so I did. You know, and I, I had a, I went to a fine arts high school, I got a big fat theater scholarship in college, but I didn't like the program, it didn't fit me. And I was singing in clubs at the time, and that was my passion. And then I went to Atlanta just to get more commercial work, I got my first audition for a film, I got the part, and I was like, okay, that makes sense to me, that kind of actor. Mm -hmm. And then I was just doing a lot of that, and, you know, a lot of radio stuff as well. And I moved to LA for the on-camera stuff, and, got my first audition for a cartoon and was not, I was never allowed to watch cartoons as a kid. Um, my, my mom had very specific ideas about things. And, uh, <laughs> and you know, all due respect. And uh, I, uh, uh, my first audition, uh, I made a VO tape just to make some cash after a couple of years of struggling in LA. I was like, well, I'll do some commercial stuff, whatever. My first audition was for a cartoon series. It was where I wrote this car in San Diego. Uh, yeah. And I, I booked it. And I was like, I don't even know how these things work. So I think the biggest key to my personal success has been the training that I've chosen and the discipline with which it has been applied. Um, the training that I chose at that time was to jump into every single available, good, quality uh, voice acting class I could find. And Dee Baker and I were in two of those classes together. Oh, and I like to say I stole him from his agent and took him to mine. <laughs> he was amazed balls, and I love him. Um, and everything I know I learned from my teachers and my peers. So I found good training, and then I applied it on a consistent basis over a long period of time. And the other training that I had was acting, which is essential you're going to do games, animation, even commercials. To now, commercials are no longer that sort of presentational thing. You know, they're, um, they're connected. I mean, people are really talking to 
you can't talk at somebody. You know, you have to talk to them. And you can't get away with that anymore. So, and uh, the other piece of training that I did, it's from singing in clubs and not wanting to lose my voice. I uh, took classical singing lessons, like opera. Um, not because that was my bent, but because I didn't want to lose my voice. And to this day, it has served me really well. Because yeah, in games, there's a lot of like, you know, and, like, say, you know, you're yelling over helicopters and stuff. <laughs> you know, it's like anything you want. Because the truth is, like, what, you know, in looking at me up here, I'm in a way the past. You know, I'm the present as well, because I think it is, I'm still working and I'm the future because I continue to work. But you guys who want to do this are the future. So, uh, you know, what I would love to do is pass on the tips that help me and watch you take them further than I ever thought of. You know, that's really what it's about. So. Have you come across people um, who you've worked with? Because I haven't heard this in any of your projects, but vocal fry is something that I've, I've, I've seen a lot of female VO um, actors start to fall in the trap of. And if, if you're not familiar with vocal fry, yeah. you, that's it. I know. it it, it's like this weird thing that you basically twist the end of your world. It's, it's a cultural evolution. I tell you, in the, um, God, was that? Late 90s, early millennium, there was a trend of, like, I'm invested, I care. We went from, I'm presentational, to, I actually care. I really care. And then there came this whole weird, sarcastic thing, like, I don't care. You can buy it or not, you can do it or not, you can follow me or not, I don't care. <laughs> that's evolved into, the vocal fry is just another form of, I'm not real, I'm too cool to really care. And the fact is, I'm a nerd, I care. <laughs> I always have, always will. I will never pretend to not care. Fry is either that, it's a way of hiding. You know, it's just a cultural trend. Everybody gets all up in arms about it. I'm like, let's look at the why, let's deconstruct it and figure out why it's there. It's simply a trend. There will be another. And uh, let's not make too much of it. Because it's annoying. <laughs> <laughs> That's what scares me is that what comes what comes next will be worse. No, uh, we, we, there will be a bottom, and and we're can you can't you guys feel it? <laughs> no, seriously, can you not feel the cultural tension we live in right now? Yeah, right. It's like financial tension, cultural tension, political tension. You know, do you, like. Global tension, mm -hmm. like it's reaching a crazy peak out there. You know, there will be a bottom. And Edward James almost said the greatest thing to me. He said, "Because for him, it's when the doo doo hits the fan. <laughs> <laughs> for me, it's if." Um, by the way, hi small, hi small, <laughs> the smalls, the small kids. <laughs> My nephews might be here somewhere. I love them too. Um, um, what was I saying? He made a brilliant point, which is that you know, as things get into this more and more tense situation, what matters not so much is what happens, it's people's response to what happens. And that's what I'm interested in. I mean, it's fun to talk about all the cool stuff and all the culture and all of this and that, that and the other, but we all know what really matters, you know, and maybe we've forgotten a little bit and we think it's what we get and what we achieve, et cetera, et cetera. But what really matters is that person and this place, and this, you know? And that's, I think, the more we pay attention to that, and there, there's a brilliant video, I think I tweeted it, I tweeted it on the plane here, because it totally made me cry, in the best way. It's a um, DNA journey. Has anyone of you seen this video? Yes, I've seen it drops. Pass that around, because it's the truth. You see this wonderful interviews with these people, and they're all, like, this is British guy going, yeah, I'm British, I'm only British, I only care about, you know, this other guy's Icelandic, he's like, I don't like Germans, I think they're really good. I'm better than everyone, you know? You see all these other people, like, I'm this, I'm loyal to my people. And they get their DNA tests back. And it actually maps out where they're from. And for most, are, for most of us, it's the globe. Mm -hmm. We're all connected. You know, that's the conversation I'm interested in so much right now. It's, it's a very moving video. If you get a chance, to check it out. But you know, that's the conversation. No, that is the conversation. Yeah. It's a conversation we all need. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I have a question. How many people in here are cert trained? Oh, dear God. Yeah. Okay. Everybody get your phones out. <laughs> it's not the Alamo draft house. You can have your phones out. <laughs> I want you to look 
of C E R T. Shannon's sorry. All right. Anyway, who's got it? Okay, someone's got it. Community Emergency Response Team. Oh, you? You're trained. We've got a CERT member in the room. Well, you're a cop. <laughs> <laughs> sorry to out you. I have such great respect. She's an the fuzz. <laughs> Cert trained. I'm not kidding. I'm cert trained, um, and everyone needs to do it. Do you guys promise me? Yes. yes. I'm sorry. Yes. yes. How about this? Will you get cert trained? This is your commander. Get your butt. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you say that one more time, then yes. Will you do it? Yes. yes. Come on. Will you do it? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's an extraordinary thing to do because then you can help people and you're not helpless and you understand what it is if there's breakdown, you're empowered. You know, it's just another level of being a grown up. And the thing about becoming more of a grown up in every corner of your life is you don't ever stop being a kid. You just add to the collection. <laughs> you know, that's all. You know, and then we can get into a whole financial conversation because that's my other place that I'm, I'm on my high horse with everybody about. <laughs> you know, learning about money. Do you know the U.S. how, anybody in here know how our current educational system evolved? It was created in the Victorian Empire because they needed to figure out how to run a global empire from a tiny little island in the Atlantic, England, uh, without computers, right? How do you do that? You create a giant human supercomputer. You standardize reading, writing, and arithmetic. What we're rewarded for in school is doing the right thing, following the rules, do not think outside the box, execute your orders. That is what you trained for in school. How well does that serve you as an adult in the world? You know, yeah. yeah, because no. the 21st century, those things aren't available to us anymore. You see the schism, you see the split in the haves and the have-nots. Mm -hmm. And it's not some giant conspiracy, well, we'll talk about that, but. <laughs> <laughs> well. It's simply that you haven't been given the tools. And you, know, you weren't given the tools because no one realized they needed to give them to you. Because they thought everything was just going to stay the same. And his swoop shifted so bloody fast, mm -hmm. it, everyone's head spinning. Like, everything's turned on its head, right? So go out there and learn about money. It doesn't make you a bad person or less creative. I am fully empowered with money. And I am fully empowered with creativity. And now, in the 21st century, this is how we live. And it's awesome. Wouldn't you love to see more artists and creators having lots of financial power and lots of political power? Yes. Then go make it happen. Right? Yes. We're done. No. <laughs> <laughs> Revolution is starting. It's hard, it's hard to drop a table. <laughs> <laughs> not if you have a question, please throw up your hand because I would love to get as many people with a question as you. We're moving for anybody else. <laughs> I'm so excited. Damn right. Um, I think it is frustrating for the community. I don't spend a lot of time on what frustrates me because I treat my energy and my mental orientation with great care. Okay. And if I spend, because we are hardwired to look for the negative for very good reason, because we need to know where the tigers are and if we're going to be eaten. <laughs> yeah, we really do. And so we have, if you find yourself constantly like fussing over stuff or worrying or freaking, you know, finding yourself in the negative, that's absolutely how the human's wired to be, right? But we're at a point in our evolution where now we get to choose something additional and even more fun than that, which is let's look at what we want. And that's how I deal with that particular issue. I look at what I want. You also have to consider that um, those films are made by giant corporate institutions. Their relationship to risk is very clear. They don't like it. They go with what they think is known quantities. That's what's so wonderful about games and independent film and animation. Their relationship to risk is if you're not risky, you don't belong. You know, and that's where you get a lot of your fun stuff. That's why TV is such a leader right now. Because their relationship to risk is kind of murky, like, oh, we can take risk, we're TV. You know, we can suck. <laughs> yes. And so, lo and behold, that suck has birthed some brilliant stuff. You know, because they don't care. But, you know, yeah. So, yeah.
I saw somebody else being nerdy. Yeah. Are you more Paragon or Renegade? <laughs> I always say Paragon is wish I, who I wish I was. Renegade is what I wish I could say. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Um, over here. Yeah. Just like truly in the whole community, I can maybe think of one person who I'm like, oh, that was a lot of work. <laughs> um, they're extraordinary. I mean, oh, good lord, Kari, who's upstairs, Gray Delisle, you know, Mary and Steve and Richard and Jane, everybody who's here, Jim and Bill. I mean, like, uh, uh, Jim Cummings, Bill Farmer, you know, Rob Paulson, I, like, I, everyone, <laughs> every single one of them. They're brilliant, and I, I, I only have, I have the talent I have today, talent. <laughs> because I work with them, you know, I learned from them. I mean, Frank Welkers or Jeff Bennett's, or, and they're directors too, they're extraordinary. Yeah, yeah so much fun. Yeah, um, granted you don't have to memorize your lines as a voice actress, but is there any dialogue from the, ver the many projects you've worked on that sticks in your mind that's memorable to you? And if, <laughs> uh, or alternatively, if there's no particular line of dialogue that's very memorable, which project has been most Memorable. Well, one of my favorite lines ever is, um, tell your friends we're coming for them. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's one of my favorites ever, but I did have a day where, is it, I'm sure there's probably some Sophia the First fans in here. Yeah. I recorded a song, has anybody heard the True Sisters? You could be crazy. True sisters and ever after friends. It's a really sweet song, right? I did that in the morning, and then in the afternoon, who in here has played Diablo 3? <laughs> in the middle of a playthrough, plug your ears. Spoiler alert. So I did that in the morning. True, true sisters. In the morning, right? And then I go to my Diablo later in the record sessions in the afternoon, and I'm like, I will kill you and eat your soul. <laughs> Busting the glass ceiling where we got Femme Chef on the box. Yes. 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 And that should be me because you guys did that. <laughs> you guys did that. You made that happen. And I was so grateful to be just the front of the arrow on that one because without the rest of the arrow, it doesn't happen. It's just brilliant. And then, you know, then further being asked to voice creme and characters like that. That's just. Extraordinary. Yeah, to, that's what I'm interested in. As you can tell, probably, I'm not much into like shoe conversations and stuff. I, I'm more like, okay, how do we change the world? How do we save this boat? How do we turn this boat in the right direction? Yeah. You know? yeah. With the, obviously, the, the, the gender issue and equality in gender for, for actors is front and center, has been for the last three to four years, both positively and negatively, obviously. Is there something that the industry could do that would be more subversive to make that change? Or is it to have, or does it have to be pitchforks and torches to you know, say, make this a better environment for, for vocal actors? 
there's two things we can do. Number one, we need to realize we're on our way to better already. And I think there, you don't motivate people, yes, you need to stomp your feet and go, this is BS, this has to change. And when people change, you need to look at them and go, nicely done. Yes. More of that, that's awesome. People need to hear when they're on the right track. It's like dog training. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> you know, they need to hear that. We all do. Because your behavior at its most basic, you're dealing with neuronal patterning, right? And you need to acknowledge, yes, correct pattern. Excellent. You know, bad pattern. <laughs> and I think I would love to see gender removed from casting. I'd love to see all ethnic, ethnical references, obviously, removed from casting. You know, if you can do that, do it. That'd be brilliant. Wherever you can, do it. You know, the one thing, too, is when you see a limitation out there, this, I think this is, <laughs> it's probably really damned annoying if you're around me, but it's, it's also one of my favorite qualities I think I have, however the heck I came across it. Um, which, you show me a limitation, I'm like, oh, really? <laughs> ah, I don't think so. I didn't see it. Sorry, is there a limitation there? I missed it. You know? And I, when I hear people go, well, it's really hard to, I'm like, just stop right there. Because you know the unconscious mind operates like a, compu- a computer, right? It does. It does not know the difference empirically between positive and negative instruction. It simply executes your orders. When you're like, I can't, blah, 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 it goes, okay and aligns all other choices you're unaware of to affirm what you just said, yes. So when you want something, you need to go, I'm excited and grateful about this. I'm excited and grateful I'm on my way to that. I'm excited and grateful this is happening in the world. You know, because thoughts are things. Anybody in here ever read Napoleon Hill, They Can Grow Rich? Yeah, put it on your list. (laughs) Remember, we're all supposed to get really good at this stuff so we can affect the world in a positive way from a powerful place and not complain we're not in power. Okay, no complaining allowed. Freaking sick and tired of complaining. It is a, just a plague upon this earth. Knock it off. <laughs> it's a cultural habit. It's very accepted. It's culturally unacceptable to speak the way that I speak, but I really don't care. Because this is the new world. Yeah. Um, you, you, I'm you're, 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 started doing games, I didn't know any of this stuff was going to be what it's going to be. I was just happy to have a job, you know? And I, it, I, I show up in my job, I had a long talk with a friend of mine early in my career, and we, he said we worked it out together. I swear to God, he just told it to me, and I'm very grateful ever since, that when you go into what, anything you're doing from the best part of yourself, even if you're cleaning a countertop, you know, you put out an energy that, that affects the world. You know, so I go into every job I do very aware that who I'm being is going to affect this, any space I'm in, whether you're hearing it later or, or whatever. So I went into games that way, and a lot of other actors honestly were like, I'm not doing that, that's way too much work. Mm-hmm. It's an animation session, you go in, and it's, it's four hours typically, you know, sometimes six, but typically four hours, and you're scheduled, you're with, unless you're doing dubbing, which is where you revoice an already produced cartoon. But normally we go in when we record, and we are a team. We all share the love. It's his line, it's their line, it's her line, it's my line. In a game, it is a four-hour, one-person show. And you are on, 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 on. You do not get that script ahead of time. You better just make a decision and make it work in the moment. It's called cold reading, right? And they're like, mm-hmm. I'm like, I'll do it. <laughs> hey, I'm there. <laughs> so it's been incredible what it has grown into. It's, it's extraordinary, yeah, to be a part of that. Thank you. Yeah, I've I've had things that I connected to very clearly. You know, um, Shepherd was one. Cinderella was another. Thorn, you know, a bunches of them I've connected with. I've also connected with bunches that I didn't get cast in. I was like, Are you kidding? That was such an amazing audition. Oh. <laughs> and then I see who they booked, and I'm like, Oh my God, she's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You know, I firmly, I don't believe in competition. I think the 21st century belongs to cooperation. You know, everybody goes around spouting off about um, survival of the fittest, you know, that whole thing. If you actually read the text, which I have not, but I'm relying heavily on my friend Chris Brown, the brilliant director who has, a couple times, and she says that cooperation is, is cited, I think, over 250 times in that same text. 
Well, the 21st century does not belong to competition. It belongs to cooperation. I believe there's enough to go around for everyone. You know, you need to cheer on your fellow people because they're your team, even if you think they're your competition. So some hands over here. Uh, first off, thank you for dealing me dealing with me yesterday when I was crying trying to talk to you. That was not dealing at all. That was authentic and beautiful. Um, what color do you want to dye your hair next? Oh, I'm sticking. I added some purple in. And I'm just going to stick with my purple and blue because the blue kind of fades to green sometimes. I love it. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I got this actually. Billboards brought me into PAX South, I think, over a year ago, a year and a half ago. And they sprayed crimson into my hair, and I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> this is happening when I get home. <laughs> it's addictive. It is it's so absolutely. addictive. I see your thought. No. <laughs> 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 airbrush right over. No, I burned every one of these. <laughs> <laughs> My wife put half of them there. <laughs> so a lot of uh, television and movie actors get a chance to play off of each other's energy and that kind of stuff. Yeah. As a voice actor, do you ever get an opportunity to do that before you go into the line? No, rarely. Probably about five percent of the time. It's a tiny bit more. Like I just did Masquerade with Matt Mercer and Courtney Taylor and Ben Hamilton and. Um, we got to record in pairs, which was lovely. Um, but it, that's very rare. Like Metal Gear, Dave and I got to work together a lot, which was great, because we've been friends for, good Lord, 21 years now. And um, uh, yeah, sometimes, it's very rare. But in, and then sometimes on the Mass Effect stuff, they have a system called Beta. It's a proprietary system, where if the person who's in the scene with you, not really with you, but technically with you, has been in to record before you, they can play you their lines. But oh. usually I was the first one. Oh. <laughs> oh. It didn't happen very often. <laughs> Some of the ending stuff, although not mm, about a third quarter of the time, that ending stuff with Keith David, oh, I love those scenes. Mm -hmm. um, but 99% of the time I'm alone. Yeah, it's, just, it's, it's in here. And that's really the process for those of you who are in voice acting and you're recording alone. You really need to break, it's just basic. Stanislavski, Udo Hagen, you know, Meisner, whoever you study, you know, acting stuff. It's like, who am I? How do I move through the world? Where am I? What do I want? Who just said something? What's my relationship to them? What's my relationship to them in this moment? Where are we on the story timeline? What did they just say? This is my response. And all that has to happen, like that. But it's like tennis, that you, or learning any sport, you do it, or, or martial art, you do it enough times, and you just have to go slowly so you get it in the right sequence, and then you're like, you know, and you're there. <laughs> and that's one of the things that I, I think is a lost um, art in direction for video, is, I mean, if you've got the right person in a booth, and you, you're following somebody else, I mean, as, as the lead in there, you, you, you're basically giving the direction for everybody else when they're hearing your playback. But directors are just rock stars if they get it right the first time. You have to be prepared if they don't, and you cannot complain if they don't, because complaining is not the thing done. And an affection is spoken to. <laughs> and it stinks up the space, really. I say that to my child all the time, you're stinking up the space, knock it off. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, knock it off. Um, yeah, your job is to, and, and sometimes a director can't do it because they thought they could and they didn't realize the missing piece of human communication that they needed to be able to accomplish the job. Your job is not to shame them or correct them. Your job is to simply fill in the blanks and they will start to understand what they did not know. You know, and you will raise, my, my command, if you will, to all of you is raise the level wherever you go. Not by what you tell people to do. Don't do that, that's annoying. <laughs> but by who you are being. Just be. And you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. You all know. I'm going to tell you. Right? Yeah. Okay. Me? Yeah. Um, two things. First off, my mom and I played through the Mass Effect games together. Oh. I played through on my own beforehand as a male shepherd, but then we played together as female shepherds. Yes. And it was so much fun. Oh. Even though when we started the second game, we didn't even get it in the PS3 broke, so we had to start over again. Oh, it's oh. 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 perfect. Like all the DLC, it was really, really fun. Oh, I'm so glad you like it. Yes. Oh. <laughs> and then, uh, a quick question. Have you dressed up as a female shepherd? I have not. I have not. Someone's becoming a costume right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Someday I will. Yeah. There might have 
in secret. I don't often dress up as my characters, but there might have been a moment somewhere that didn't happen in Orlando where I didn't end up looking like Cinderella for a little while. <laughs> Thank you. 